Hello Geeks and Gamers, Matt Link here with your Gamer Goggles. Uh, and we are at the Palladium Open House. Uh, this is Greg Diazek. He's one of the freelance authors that has done a lot, a lot of work for uh, Palladium. And we're going to start with some of the, well actually we're going to start with the story of how you got started. And this is a lesson for all of you I believe yeah, that want to write. Uh, it's a simple story. Um, like you, I'm, I was uh, a super fan. I loved Palladium books, got really involved into it, uh, became a great game master. Um, I started writing my own notes here and there, and uh, I saw the, the quarterly magazine coming out called The Rifter, and it's like, you know what, I, I, I should write something for that, because I've, I've got some stuff that's worth being written. And so I published, or sent in my first uh, little 10-page article, and uh, uh, Wayne liked it so much, he put me in uh, Rifter number 10 here. It's a great cover, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, it wasn't a whole lot of money, but it was a huge self-esteem booster. It's like, wow, look at this. Uh, I'm published. This is awesome. And uh, I just kept playing games with my, my groups. And every time I had a cool concept or a game that was going on, it's like, well, we'll write down some more notes here, and we'll, we'll get this big thing. And then next thing I know, I've got this huge stack of ideas. And it's like, well, here we go. Let's, let's, uh, let's put together a... Another Rifter article, and then another Rifter article, and uh, it just kept spooning out of there. And um, uh, I guess back so about 2008, seven, eight, the uh, uh, Kevin has been starting to get a lot of uh, uh, unsolicited manuscripts coming in, and uh, it's like, well, well, we're getting too many, we're going to have to close the doors. And um, I remember that. Yeah, I was I was at the the point where I was like. Um, I am so sick and tired of waiting for Lemiri to come out. I'm going to write my own stuff because my players are begging me to take them underseas and do all this crazy stuff underwater. And so I started writing all, all this stuff and I've got just enough for a register article. And then um, I see Brandon Aiden sneak in a, a, a book and I'm like, what? He's, he's just a rifter guy. What's going on? What's going on? So uh, I just decided that uh, I'll write Kevin a letter. Say, hey, look, Kevin, I'm this guy. I like to write. Uh, you see me in the rifter. Uh, I'd like to write uh, something for Lemuria. Here's a 10-page outline. May I write this? What's your thoughts? And uh, to my surprise, Kevin wrote me back a letter and says, hey, Greg, yeah, this is great. Um, if you're going to write a book, just focus on Lemuria, because you've got lots of stuff here, but just, just focus in on Lemuria. So I, I cut all the stuff that wasn't Lemuria out, and I compiled the book, and um, what you see was um, was uh, this book here, of Lemuria. Now, um, I did have to call Kevin every couple of months to, to say, hey, Kevin, where's my book? How's it coming? And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, they are a big staff. I mean, a small staff. So, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. And Kevin's got a lot on his plate, so he, he's actually told us, you know, call me every six months to remind me because I'm probably busy with some new project. But I think Kevin has a little too much on his plate. I'm pretty sure Kevin has ADHD, guys. <laughs> pretty sure. Yeah, yeah. So, and then, um, you know, it's not easy running your own corporation, as I'm finding out myself. And uh, one of the things that, that, that happened with Lemuria, which I actually found out was really awesome, is uh, at first they didn't have any money to get the project off the go. Like they, um, they were struggling trying to find something to push it. And then someone said, hey guys, you just do a Kickstarter kind of thing for it. And they Kickstarted this? Not Kickstarted, but they did their own crowdsourcing kind of, kind of deal. Oh, okay. And um, you know, Kevin said, you know, how do you feel about doing like a Kickstarter thing? crowdsourcing thing for the mirror and I was like cool sure whatever as long as my book gets published I'm happy and uh, next thing I know uh, we're going with 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 the hardcover edition and then we got a uh, the emerald edition so and that's how they came about yeah and then there's like the PDF format for the few people who were lucky enough to order them online with the, uh, the special sponsorship with the, the crowdsourcing stuff they were doing and uh, you know, I'm just like, this is this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. Like, I, all I was expecting was a simple soft cover book, and I'm happy. So uh, you know, getting all these extra little features kicking in, and everybody's getting all excited about Lemuria. And um, the funny thing about Kevin, he is like a match. You, you just one thing. Well, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's stay focused. Let's stay focused. You, you give him an idea, and you just start bouncing them back and forth. Like we were having conversations about Lemuria this and Lemuria that, and it's just, oh Greg, I love the flying, you know, the Lemurian cities. I love this, I love that. And then he starts telling me about this, and then Matthew Clemens pipes in, and it's like, we gotta do this, and gotta do this, and we just we just started spiraling around. And then people like Chuck Walton started going, 
Let me draw that for you. Oh, I good, Dang. good, good, good. I can't wait to get started now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, then, and then you know, Chuck's going, going like, it, it's, it's, you know, it's a like match to rocket fuel, and it's like bang, and Chuck's pulling out these massive, like, super detailed drawings of stuff, and we're just like rolling and rolling, and and, and Kevin's like firing me stuff back, saying, Hey, Greg, change this up, re-edit this. We're re we're doing this all over again, and we're changing this around. I'm like, awesome. I'm involved in the writing process. This is cool, and and. And then lo and behold, you know, you, you, you get your nice little... Let me see the cover of this real quick. And see, it's really cool. What's really, really cool is his name is on top of Kevin's. Yeah, yeah. That, that is really yeah. cool. <laughs> I, I would have been happy with, with before, Kevin. Yeah, yeah. So, but uh, you know, on top is still pretty cool, so I'm, I'm really happy about that. And um, Kevin was actually telling me some really interesting stories about the, uh, the artwork for this. Like, uh, uh, when I, uh, I guess when I got notification of Kevin kind of slipped me a couple of the early uh, sketches and I'm just like this is so awesome this is amazing and uh, it was really good to see like the, the preliminary drawings I, I saw a couple of different versions like oh, I like this one I like this one and so Kevin was actually picking my brains and getting me feedback on this and this was it was awesome being a part of that uh, design process and uh, after that you know it's um, I dove right into the Andrew Seas book or I guess it's now a new Navy book um, and uh, for those of you who uh, we missed the, uh, the open house. It's, it's actually been sitting on Kevin's desk for the last two years. I'm promoting it. If you want it, ask Kevin to get the Underseas book slash New Navy book out. Um, I just recently finished up the uh, Hardware Unlimited uh, book for Heroes Unlimited series. Uh, it's basically a 150 pages of gadgets, 50 pages of vehicle construction, and then 100 pages of details on how to run a hardware character everything from making new characters to how a character grows like um, one of the biggest problems that I had running or playing hardware characters in some of my games is that the hardware character always got screwed over you know your cool toy gets destroyed well I'm sorry Greg you're gonna have to wait six months while you order the parts and rebuild your thing meanwhile my my buddy's ultra physical structure guy is like throwing fireballs around and uh -huh. I'm having fun and I'm like <sighs> I have that same problem with a lot anybody in any game system that makes magic items or has to make items. It just the downtime needed just kills you. Yeah, it's yeah. ridiculous. So I, I wrote all these rules to help game masters kind of go. So what do we do if we destroy your stuff? Well, you know, you've got this kind of budget. You can repair this kind of stuff. Just some kind of generic numbers. And to that's kind of, awesome. Just to guide the game master, because my game, you know, my game master is a great guy, but he really doesn't understand technology. And for him to kind of go, oh, I'm sorry, Greg, it's broken. Let's roll a couple things, and you can have it fixed by tomorrow. <laughs> Meanwhile, the rest of the players are dying because they're being killed by the villain. I'm like, ah, what am I gonna do? I'll jump in there. I've got no skills. And die. So it was, it was, you know. Yeah, I, I opening. So I, I took a lot of those things, and it was just like, well, okay, I need to work out on the, the equipment list. I, I have spares. What happens with my old prototypes? Can I keep them? Can I rebuild them? Uh, do I have a new budget for making new stuff and upgrading my current equipment? Um, and for any of you who, who's watched uh, Iron Man three, you know when, when Tony calls in the, uh, the what is it, the party protocol, and you see all these robots kind of show up. You know, it's, it's that kind of mentality. Like I've got the resources. I'm, I'm the hardware guy. All I've been doing is building stuff. Villains here. Let's pull out the party. You know, party patrol. We're gonna, we're gonna, you know, crack some heads and, and go. And that's ahead. the way it should be. And that's the way hardware characters should be. Yes. Yes. So they should be able to feel like a hero. Yeah. Instead of a sidekick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's what I'm doing with Hardware Unlimited. Is basically turning your hardware character, well, hardware characters and hardware wannabes into real powerful characters that can go toe to toe with your standard mega hero guys. So, outside of uh, New Navy, do you have anything else coming up the pipe with Palladium? Um, I do have Rift China 3 sitting on my uh, my desk at home. Uh, Ooh, are you allowed to share any of it yet? <laughs> uh, actually, surprisingly, um, was it the last open house? Last open house I ran a couple of uh, early playtests with some of the guys. So there are some guys out there who have had a sneak peek, and you guys know who you are. Um, and they've seen some of the, the preliminary stuff, and I've been getting a lot of good feedback from that. Um, I've mostly finished it off. It's now actually about 400 pages, so I was talking with Kevin. Wow. And he said, yeah, Greg, make us two books. <laughs> wow. So uh, I guess once I'm finished with this hardware stuff, which I guess they did last week. I haven't week, even seen China 2 or 1 yet. Yeah, well, it's, it's big, big. Um, but my, my biggest beef with, with China was that it was this big encompassing thing. Well, it's huge. It's huge, but no dragons, no mortals, no um, 
mythical creatures, and, and, and there was this huge aspect that was missing from it. And yeah, if you look back at Mystic China, they kind of touched on it again, but again, no dragons, no yeah, one of the big a lot of mythical monsters and creatures from Chinese mythology. Okay, I'm removed. I mean, you'll probably hear this again. Um, we pretty much, I lost my Rifts group pretty much around 2002. Um, been trying to rebuild one ever since. So, are they doing anything, or have you done anything cooler with the martial arts since then? Uh, is a Shaolin monk really a Shaolin monk that can handle mega advantage? I, or is he still going to die? I, I didn't touch on the Shaolin monk. I guess the Ren Shi monk. Well, you know, there's just that concept of this, yeah. the, how Shaolin are quote unquote immortal warriors. I, I went more with the. Um, Immortals. I, like I kind of, I took a lot of the stuff from Mystic China and converted it over into Rifts when I did the Immortals. Like I just, I wanted to follow Eric Wujuk's theme. Like okay. I, didn't, I didn't want it to seem like this is totally out of play because this is not expected kind of thing. So I, I tried to follow Eric's theme as much as possible. Um, I did have to play a lot with the mechanics because they changed them so much in the uh, Rifts China stuff. Um, but I was focusing more on the, the magic stuff. Like the Rifts China Three is actually called uh, Masters of Magic. Uh, tentatively, oh, so it's like at last Avatar stuff. Yeah, so it's like mortals, <laughs> it's like oh, yeah, magic it's spells, it's, it's like good. crazy magic items, it's like really weird Chinese magic doohickeys and stuff. And I go into like calligraphy and, and written magic and stuff. So there's like, it's huge. There's like really, lots of really good stuff. There's a whole bunch of uh, world information as well on all the remaining Yama kingdoms that got left out. Uh, I touch a bit on some of the peripheral kingdoms like Tibet and um, Nepal and the and, and up, up around the Himalayas kind of area, um, just to kind of flesh it out for anybody trying to play within the midst of China. Um, and then I, what I, I'm guessing will probably turn into the second book is literally all the legendary creatures from China. So the phoenix, all the different kinds of dragons, uh, yin tigers, a um, whole bunch of weird Chinese races that they talk about in some of their mythology and stuff. So how much research did you have to do for this? I have a table that's probably about this size that I've got books. It's about six feet long. Six feet long. So this whole table is, is just filled with books that I, I borrowed from libraries or I borrowed, borrowed from Kevin or I bought myself from Eric's uh, old old uh, library that was on sale a couple a couple open houses ago. And uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of research, a lot of reading. Um, but you have to balance that with the style. Like like Eric Wujuk had this style, he had this motion and I was, or this, this energy and I was trying to just and couple that and run with it. Like I didn't want to have it come to a dead stop and see something completely different. And that really says a lot about you yeah. and about your skill. Because if you did it successfully, to blend yourself so that you become like, nobody can tell you're different between other on that takes a lot. Yeah. It takes a lot of talent. Yeah. And it's a hard work because the rule sets are so different in China just because China is so uh, exclusive, so different from the rest of the world. Yeah, you keep saying they're different. How would you, uh, like, like let's say, some poor coalition squad ended up in China. Would they have a chance? No. Well, what if what if the, what if it was the other way around? What if some of the Chinese guys ended up in? Um, well, one of the rules. Chicago. One of the rules. Chicago sets that, are dead, yeah. but <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't. You know. One of the rule sets that was put out in China. I think it was in. Um, I think it was the second book. Yeah, it's towards the end of the second book. They basically go in and say, if a character from Rifts China gets out of Rifts China and goes somewhere else. Uh, they get a 30% power cut, basically, which kind of dumbs them down a bit. Um, I know in my games, wow. I, in my games, I would have like broken. Yeah, I would have just left them and let them have fun because I, I'm the guy that lets you know a cyborg run around with mega damage weapons in cheat town and kill you know fighting STC creatures. There's ramifications for it, but uh, I, I you know if he wants to run around with the, the gloves off, then he's going to get coalition coming after him with the gloves off kind of deal. So uh, that's the way it should be. Yeah. So. But in, in game mechanic wise, you know the people who leave China are actually thirty percent less powerful. But they're still mega damage. So how do they explain that in game? Um, is that done by like blade lines or so more so, so much closer together or something? Well, the um, the Yama kings when they came in, they basically shrouded all of China into a, a, they put a, a magical mist around it to kind of hide it from the Jade Emperor and, and the gods and stuff, and just to kind of keep it separate from the rest of the world. And then, then again, you've got all the different hells kind of merging in with all the different lands in China, messing things up even further. So you've got this quasi-dimensional anomaly thing going on in China, which is kind of cool because it makes it its own world setting. 
but you know, within a world setting. A world setting. But if you want to throw in your coalition soldiers or your glitter boy marching through, then yeah, I guess you can. Um, Not gonna survive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It depends who you talk to. Yeah, if you're if you're marching in one of the Yama Kingdom's realms, yeah, you're gonna get smite or worse. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's if you try if you yeah, and if you try to bring like a regular magic user in. They don't actually get any more boost to it. It's, it's because the uh, the Chinese magics are so intertwined with qi, and the way they wrote this up in Mystic China is that it's um, it's like a forced learned psychic power. So it's oh it's, wow, it's not like a, a natural psychic where you've got ta-da, I've got like telepathy or telekinesis or something like that. Uh, they treated it as uh, well. I want to learn martial art. Okay, well you can no longer take psionics, but you get to have ISP and you get to do all these cool martial art special powers, and you can turn invulnerable. Or, uh, maybe you see. So how does, what's the name of the book? Ninjas and Super Spies. Yeah. How does that, um, how do the martial arts styles go into Mystic China, and do they work well? What do you have to do to convert the, uh, Qi to the ISP? Anything? Uh, I think it's a six-point conversion. So for every six, for every one point of Qi, you would convert roughly to about six points of ISP. But nice. If you're taking Mystic, or if you're taking uh, Ninja Super Spies or Mystic China, it is so different that you're probably better off to use the uh, conversion book, which is. Well, I was more interested in like the, the different martial arts systems because that was that was actually what we played. That was my okay. favorite thing to do. Okay. Uh, was convert martial arts systems into the Rift's world. Yeah. Um, and then we would have like Samus pilots. Oh you shoot. Know, <laughs> You know, we just, we, we had, because we were, the four guys that I played with in high school, we were all in the same martial arts class. Okay. So we were, we were nuts with it. Yeah. Primary system, secondary system. Yeah. I mean, we had Samus pilots that, instead of having, um, hand, you know, hand, the regular missiles, they'd take stabs or three sectional stabs <laughs> and fly through the whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, the Rift stuff, they kind of changed around. The, they basically said that all the martial artists have two martial arts. One's your conventional hand-to-hand -hand combat style. The other one is more like a martial arts power. Uh, it was kind of described as a martial arts in, in terms of what it, what it was labeled as, but it basically gave you all the powers of a certain theme or style of martial artist. For example, for example, uh, drunken style kung fu. There's a there's actually a martial arts for drunken style, but then there's also the martial art power, which gives you all the uh, uh, automatic dodging and the there's like a, like a barf attack, and there's a drunken resistance and stuff like that. Uh, and there are other ones where you've got like a regular martial arts style, like that you can take uh, Shaolin Kung Fu as your, your basic hand-to-hand -hand style, and or sorry, advanced hand-to-hand -hand style. And then you take something more exotic as your martial art power, like um, Cotton Fist. So you can do mega damage on top of that, you get extra protective armor, and you've got these special touch attacks and stuff. Uh, so they, they were kind of combining the powers the martial arts is two separate entities, but they work well together. Um, and with the, the Mystic, or with the um, Masters of Magic Rift China 3, um, a lot of the special martial art powers, or sorry, a couple of the martial art powers really played well to a wizard or a Wu style class. And um, so you could have a guy that could sit there and like channel all this magic energy, and then what do you do with it? Well, I'm a Wu, I'm a wizard, I'm basically a Chinese Ley Light Walker, and then just let him have it. And, um, yeah, so it can be quite powerful, you know, regular Leyline Walker versus a Chinese Geomancer or, or, or Gmat Mage. And you can get these massive build-ups of PPE, which they need to fight Yama King, so it's, it's understandable. But then when you come out of China, you lose a lot of that Qi magic because it's so focused in China. And you lose a lot of that power, but it, it still makes you as powerful as a regular Leyline Wizard. Or Leyline Walker or, or a Shifter or something. Crazy, interesting. It is. It is. Uh, I missed a lot, man. I feel bad. <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad that all my friends graduated from college. Uh, <laughs> they should still be there, failing. Yeah. Uh, that's awful. Um, so, uh, what else are you writing? Anything for any other, like, for yourself or for any other companies? Or are you strictly going to be a freelancer for Palladium? Uh, Palladium is my my hobby. I enjoy writing. Uh, it's uh, it's a good way for me to express my creativity, um, and it's it's something that I can do at a moment's notice. And you pull up my phone, I got a cool idea, I write down something, then I go back home and write a more verbose uh, story for it or something. 
I do have a very big background in art, um, and I thought about submitting some stuff to the Rifter or even some books and stuff, but my, uh, I really haven't been a professional artist in 15 years or so. So my, my art is a, a little, little practice. A little, I need to practice on I it. I mean, you can look at some of their original art and their art now, and it's come a long way. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I could probably submit something and maybe get it, but I, I personally wouldn't feel it's up to the, the, the snuff that I'd want it to be. So uh, I think because there's such a huge backlog with Palladium with getting books out, I might just kind of let it coast for a bit and then start practicing my artwork and maybe slip some of those in the rifters every once in a while and see how that goes. But, uh, Oh, that's a great way to start. That's, I mean, I told people I wanted to write, you know, get in the rifter, get yeah. in the rifter. Well, even if you want to do something like artwork, if you think it's a piece of crap, send it in. Wait for Wayne to tell you it's a piece of crap before you believe yourself. You know, and, and just keep working at it. If it's bad, if that's good. That means you're, you're trying, you're doing something, but keep practicing, get better, keep submitting to the rifter. Um, it's a great source for someone just trying to break in. Um, Kevin and Wayne are awesome for giving you great feedback. If they give you any kind of critical feedback, make sure you take it. Yeah, apply it. Uh, I know a lot of people who get offended and upset and they're like, Oh my god, you just said it was horrible! And it's like, dude, just deal with it. He's trying to give you some, some positive feedback about your, your, your way you wrote something or the way you drew something. Make the corrections and send it back. Get it, get it in. And, yeah, and that is something that uh, I think they have as an advantage. I mean, I haven't submitted anything yet for the Rifter, but I can tell that uh, working with Kevin and Wayne is about a relationship, which is really what you want with an editor. Yeah. And that's what they are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, with that said, if you're interested in writing or you want to be a part of the Palladium universe in a bigger way, submit. Keep it going. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, let's make the Rifter weekly. Yeah. <laughs> I think we even want to punch you after that. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I don't even know him that well yet. <laughs> Weekly. That would be a lot of work because these are all around 150 pages. Yeah, well, it takes him about three months to get one of them out, and you know he's got to edit all the stuff. He's got to wait for the guy to submit the stuff. He's got to assign artists. He's got to get. The Rifter really is a big project. It is. It it really is, and I don't even know how many times a year they do it anymore. But it's still four times a year, and I, I give Wayne lots of kudos that's, to this because that's, it's a lot of work, and especially with Palladium's other schedule being so whacked out, it is nice to see that they have a solid piece of, of, of work coming out regularly that you can, can expect. Yeah, it's, it's huge. Yeah. Um, so, anything else you want to add? I didn't do it off camera. Yeah, off camera. Uh, I was, <laughs> yeah, I was chatting. <laughs> anything else you want to add? Um, Oh, yeah. I just started up my own 3D printing business doing mechanical engineering. I don't know. You can see that card. Uh, well, we'll get it there. There, <laughs> there you can see that. There you go. Free advertising for my new business. So uh, I do mechanical systems design and mechanical engineering and 3D printing. So what can you do with your engineering solutions for gamers? Well, uh, my target market is originally um, uh, the military. Uh, I've, my history is a lot of uh, armor design, military design, equipment design, landmine survival. You can make your tanks. Yeah, make tanks. Um, but um, a lot of those skill sets apply to gamers. Um, I can make miniatures. Uh, I've had one guy ask me to make him a, uh, an entire Halo style suit for a Halloween costume out of printed parts. Um, Wait, a whole suit? Yeah. Like life size? Life size, fully articulated. Form fit to him? Form fit to him, yeah. How much would that cost? I'm still working on the number for the quote form. So it, it, it was, I was like. How many grand? Uh, probably a couple grand, yeah. 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 I mean, because I would imagine even a 28 millimeter. 28 millimeter mini is not that cheap. No, no. It's, uh, I've, I've been told that it's about 55 cents uh, a gram, but um, I don't know. Uh, I haven't actually done the math myself, so. Ideas. Ideas. They're out there. So if you got questions, uh, I'm sure. Uh, well, you, actually, a great a great thing for him to do would be like if you are into making terrain and you want something modular, then you can get him the, the specs. I bet he can make you a one of that you can cut apart and make your own molds. Yeah. Or if you if you're doing terrain design or you're doing like a landscaping for a mini battle or something, and you need like a, a bridge or a special house or a gun placement that you only really need one of, 3D printing is the perfect medium for doing that. Um, the plastics come in specific colors, so if you want like a military green or khaki or a flat black, 
Um, I've even got glow in the dark stuff. So if you want to have like weird helicopter pads or something that glows on on, on the neon stage. signs, neon signs that glow in the dark for your Whoa. guys. Yeah, yeah. So crazy stuff like that would would work. Um, if you want like large runs, we can talk about getting plastic molding done. But uh, the 3D printing industry is, is is ideal for the small, short short run kind of design work. You need something built because it's customized or specific for a purpose. That's pretty good. Like he could take a picture of the open house or the warehouse and you can have a 3D model made but it'd be pretty boring because it's a regular old building people uh, anyway All thanks right. for watching guys uh, I hope that you see this before too long and uh, see you guys I don't know where I'll be next Origins probably have a good day thank you thank, thank you, very much. you.